um, I think I just have this short introduction here or definition here that pretty much talks about what an LMS is. And I'll give examples and scenarios of how the LMS is being used and implemented. Now, look at your typical physical training where you organize your training, you have your people come to class, you manually take attendance, and when they are done, if they have tests or you do quiz, you collect the paper, then you go back to the office. If you're marking it, you mark it, you grade them, and then you send in certificates, and then you keep all these things in papers because at the end of the month, you probably need to do a report to show the people you've trained, the people that passed your trainings, and um, the courses that you've deployed, and so on, just to show the organization that yes, you've, you've been doing a number of things in your unit, and try to also measure the feedback from this training. Now, if you think about that process and you look at implementing it for a staff of maybe five, it's probably going to be easy to implement. But when you are looking at a staff of maybe 2,000, or maybe you have just 100 staff, where your staff are spread, are spread across different geopolitical zones or uh, geographical locations, then you now start realizing some challenges that you might encounter. Uh, so you are looking at the opportunity cost of having these people to come to class. You are looking at um, the cost of planning the entire training program. Because again, when you are looking at the cost of trainings, you are not just looking at the amount you paid for the facilitator to come. You're also going to calculate the cost for people with organizations that pay for accommodation of their staff. You are going to pay for the accommodation for the staff that have to fly in for the training. You'll pay for all space. You'll pay to print textbooks and so on and so forth. Now, if you now look at, um, calculate all those things, and you're trying to calculate the return on investment of training, you realize that the bulk of the money you spent on the training was not even for the facilitator or the content itself, but for the planning. And that's where the technology LMS is now coming in to help save the day, or should I say even e-learning generally. And a learning management system is a software, a cloud-based software that helps to facilitate the management, delivery, and tracking of your training. So if we pick those three things, the first is management. That means that with an LMS, you are able to have your courses somewhere and people can go there whenever they want to go and take it. So it means that people don't need to, you don't need to schedule a time. People can just go online, log into the platform, take their courses. Then you are looking at delivery, which is them assessing it, which is could be on their laptops, could, they, could be on their mobile devices. That platform is there. You don't need to de um, dedicate a staff to always be there to say, okay, somebody has come to request for this course, you should, um, assign it to them. The staff can always go there when they need it. And then tracking of learning content. Now, we are talking about data. We are talking about analytics. We are talking about uh, measuring completion or participation of learning, which if you look at it in the manual sense, it's going to be tedious. But imagine a system that already has the feature that you can just go whenever you want, see the back end to see, okay, this particular course that we assigned to our staff, how many of them have even enrolled for the course? You have that record. How many of them have started the course? You have that record. How many of them have completed but failed the course? You can spool that record. And how many of them have successfully completed it? You can spool that record such that if your supervisor or maybe you want to do an emergency ex, um, exco, uh, exco board or board report, and they are saying that, um, I'll pick um, Ibrahim, for example. Ibrahim, give us the reports of the trainings that you've deployed from January to March. Instead of going to an Excel sheet or trying to pull all the papers together. You can easily log on to this backend and then download the, the CSV or Excel report, do a little tweak to make it presentable, and then you have your results. So that's pretty much what an LMS is. And as we go into the course, um, I'll show us the different types of LMS there. As I've said earlier, 
And I'll talk about the uh, the way you can also drive adoption. And maybe during the question and answer, I'll be able to answer some of the technical questions or concerns that you probably have around the LMS. And one thing you should also know about the LMS is that it is a cloud-based uh, um, solution, which means that it is accessible anywhere. It is not like, so there are two forms of deployment of um, applications which can be on premise or in cloud. I promise not to go technical, but then the essence of the cloud is that it is hosted online and anywhere you are in the world, you are able to access it. Also, mind you, there are some LMS implementations that are also restricted to a particular environment. But then as we talk about the implementation of LMS, we will talk about some of the concerns and why people do things like that. But the primary um, approach of deploying LMS is to make it accessible anywhere, which again, it is one of the reasons why we're going digital in the first place. So to go into the primary functions, which is pretty much what I discussed um, earlier as I was talking about this um, um, three pillars of the elements. The content creation and management is one of the primary functions. So if you are looking to um, get an element or you are looking to onboard an element into your organization or you want to recommend an element or some people are coming to you and say, oh yes, we have this lovely LMS, uh, we want you to get it for your organization. These are the four basic or five basic functions you should look out for. And the first is content creation and management. Now, your LMS should be able to store courses and also categorize your courses. So for example, for organizations, and I'll give an example of projects I've worked on. Within an organization, you can decide to categorize your course based on the functions, which means that uh, if you have an HR team, admin team, technology team, you can say that, okay, these are the trainings we want for these people. On the LM, your LMS should allow you to categorize those courses that you put on it based on that function. And the content format can vary. At the very minimum, your LMS should be able to take documents, which can be PDF or Word document or even PowerPoint. But at the very least, your LMS should be able to take PDF document. Your LMS should be able to take video content, which could either be MOV, MP4, whatever video format it is. At least that you should be able to take one of the um, formats. Then your LMS should be able to take interactive e-learning course formats, which can either be SCOM or AICC. So again, I don't want to go into technical, but as we discuss later, we'll probably speak into that if anybody wants me to elaborate on those, those different formats. But at the very least, documents, videos, audios are the minimum requirement for your elements. Now, if you want to go a bit technical as well, you're not going to the e-learning um, standards like the SCOM and ERCC where you're able to have some interactive courses. But then those things should be able to be uploaded on your platform and you should be able to categorize them, which is where we have the cost management. Now for cost creation, cost creation is not a do or die requirement, which is that your L on your elements, you should be able to go there and create a course directly on the platform. Now, there are some LMSs that have that feature, but then again, the level of interactivity you, you can create on an LMS would not be as sophisticated as if you had gone to create it somewhere else or using another tool. Maybe later we might talk about e-learning courses and then the different uh, concepts around e-learning course designs. And maybe we, on that session, I'll probably be able to go deeper into the uh, multimedia design principles and the likes. But in terms of interactivity, there might be limitations on LMS because again, the LMS is primarily for you to host and manage your courses. There are some of them that you can create courses on it, but again, the functionalities are, are very limited. Then the next bit is the delivery, which is what we have on the right-hand side. The delivery is, your learners or your employees or your colleagues being able to access the courses on the platform. 
And this delivery, there are a lot of things you also look out for. The convenience is one and the platform compatibility. Can people easily access it? Yes. On what platform are they mandated to use a specific device or it is compatible on all platforms? Now, the fact that people can access it wherever they are is one score or one goal for the LMS. Now, if you now start going further into the com um, system compatibility, then you can now start the type, depending on what your objectives are within the organization, which we will discuss when we are talking about the implementation of LMS. Depending on what your objectives are, you can now determine on what platforms should these courses be delivered on or should people be able to access the courses from. But then one thing is important, people are able to assess courses on the LMS. Then the next thing is tracking and assessment. Remember I said earlier, and that those are one of the pains that the LMS is trying to solve for us, is that that time or that pain in tracking completion, tracking those people that have started and so on and so forth, your LMS should be able to give you that report at the click of a button. So we go to the LMS, I should be able to, there should be a model called reports and I should be able to filter my reports to get me particular things that I want. Now, the extent of those reports also vary by LMS. There are some LMSs that will give you detailed reports to even show you when people log on to the platform so that you can even if, for example, one of your KPIs is seeing how many visitations you have on your LMS. Some LMS are quite detailed like that to show you that on Monday, Demola Johnson logged on to the platform at 10 or 12. He logged out at 1 p.m. And then you can do that. Now, some LMSs would only give you reports in line with their this um, staff learning. And we are looking at if they enrolled for a course, if they start the course, because you can enroll for a course and not start the course. So you are looking at if they enrolled for a course, if they start the course, if they've um, completed the course, if they failed the assessment and so on and so forth. So your LMS at the very minimum should be able to give you reports on learners' activities on courses uploaded. You should also be able to, at the very minimum, get feedback on, on the courses that you have been that you have uploaded on the on the LMS. So people should be able to give you feedback, say, this course was great. People should be able to chat to say, oh yes, this 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 thing was nice. Or because those feedback are things that you will use to also improve the course. Then the next bit in that uh, segment is still the assessment. Now, not, LM, not all LMSs have the assessment model, but the thing is I would always advise that at the very least, if you are going to get an LMS, make sure it has the assessment model. And the assessment model, whilst you can create your courses with some authoring tool and embed your assessment, there are some times that you would want to be able to create assessment standalone independent of your courses. And those assessments can be used for different things. In the organization, for example, you might want to do maybe a quiz on a product, maybe a product knowledge quiz. You don't want to start using a third party application when you already have a supposed learning management system that should be able to deploy an assessment to test people's knowledge. Maybe you want to do a competency assessment, for example. You should be able to create those assessments even if they are, you are limited to true or false, fill in the gaps and the like, you should have that minimum assessment module on your LMS. Then the fourth one is communication and collaboration. Now, one of the challenges with e-learning or self-paced e-learning is the lack of collaboration with for other learners. And that's why some people will still rate classroom training over your e-learning because you know when you're in a classroom you are able to ask people questions you're able to ask the facilitator questions and this and that so what some elements that i've tried to do is incorporate that kind of experience on the platform so if you are looking to drive effective learning as well as social learning you should make sure that 
at the very least, your LMS has that communication or collaboration model, which means that either per course basis, people that have enrolled on that course are able to discuss with themselves. Again, we all do WhatsApp chats and the like. So we are all used to having forum kind of conversation. So you should look at how your um, learners can leverage on the platform to have those kind of communication. And again, depending on how much resource you have within the organization and depending on the context structure or how you develop the courses, if you have people who are going to serve as subject matter experts within your organization, you can always have them as teachers on the courses such that when somebody drops a comment or drops any, any concerns in the query in the forum of the, of the course, those people who we we'll serve as the teacher or the subject matter expert can always come to provide that um, clarification. That's a way to kind of like simulate what you would have in your regular phys um, physical training. And then the last but not the least is your administration and reporting. It is one thing for the system to track those activities. It's another thing for you to be able to spool the report and then present it to whoever is required to present it. So at the very least, to, you should be able to not just track, but export reports. And like I said earlier, the, the um, types of reports you get would vary. So it is always good for you to, before you even go and discuss or even engage um, vendors on whatever elements you would want, you first of all need to also look at it to say, okay, what are the things I'm looking at? And I'll discuss that in detail when I get to the implementation of LMS. What kind of reports do we need? Would this LMS give us this report? But ideally, and you'll find them in most of the LMSs, which I also talk about the different types we have, you, should, you are able to get um, reports from your LMS. And administration, you should be able to have different user privileges. So you have your admin, who is going to be the one to oversee the LMS in terms of enrolling people and the likes. You can have other sub admins like the teacher who I explained earlier that would be assigned to a particular course and will be able to provide guidance in the forums of that course and, and, and different kind of, and then you have your learners who are the people that are taking the course and they all have their different privileges. And that's where what's really the administration of the LMS um, covers. Before I proceed, do we have questions or do we do the questions outside after the presentation? If this is going well, please just drop a chat. If you are with me, please just drop a chat so that I know that I'm making sense. And if I'm not making sense, let me just pack my bag and go. <laughs> just so you're making a lot of sense. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Mombasa myself and I'm enjoying uh, your presentation. It's going very well. Uh, I'm awesome. grateful. Awesome. Yes. Thank you very much, Richard. I see Nelson yeah. laughing then. Good, good, yeah. good. So to the next bit, which is the key features of functionalities. Now, these features and functionalities feed from the primary functions of an LMS. So those are the things you look out for. But for you to be able to um, achieve these functions, there are some things that the LMS should be able to do, which are some of the things that I've pre uh, pretty much discussed. And I think the bit I didn't talk about is user management. Now for you, and again, it's just some things about technic technicalities of the LMS. For users to be able to log on to a platform and use the platform, it means that the LMS must have a user management model, which means that it has that feature that allows people to create their profiles on it. So you look at your regular e-commerce websites, for example, um, maybe like the likes of Jumia. I think Jumia is all over Africa, where you, you log on to buy things. Now, if you log on that time, maybe after you purchase some, the platform another time, to see what you've bought before, how much you've spent, and if there is something in your cart, you'll be able to see it to know if you are still buying it or not. And that's how your LMS should be. When users log on to the platform, depending on their rights, a learner, for example, I should be able to see courses that I've enrolled for, courses that I've completed, and courses that maybe I've um, failed and I'm, I'm meant to redo. 
or if there are assignments, I should be able to see the assignments due date. Now, some of these LMSs um, are able to deploy the asynchronous and the synchronous, synchronous learning. And again, try not to go into, into um, some technicalities and not going off course. There are different types of e-learning um, courses that they can be, or yes, e-learning courses that they can be. But then maybe, like I said, if I speak to Nelson and he, he invites me again, we can talk about e-learning courses generally. So for those ones, there are some courses that are timed. So whilst you have some self-paced self -paced course, which means that I can log on the platform and take it at my own view, there are also some courses that can be hosted on the platform that are meant to be live online learning. And those courses are timed in, in the sense that we can say, okay, this is the timetable for this course. Everybody come online to take it on this day. And then we give assignments. So if I have, if the platform has a user management system, if there is an assignment, I should be able to see it on my dashboard that, oh yes, we have an assignment. Oh yes, these are the courses that I'm meant to do. These are the courses I have completed. These are the certificates I have earned. I can re-download these certificates. And so that's the bit about the user management. I think I've talked about the course creation, course management, assessment and quiz, and also progress tracking and analysis. So I'll go into the two broad types of LMS now, just so that we have like this um, high level knowledge of the types of LMS there. And other LMSs, the different types of LMSs now feed into these two broad types. And they are the open source LMS and the proprietary LMS. And I don't know if we have any technology person on the call. When you say open source codes, open source codes generally are codes, series of codes that are developed to achieve something or for a program that is made open to anybody who can access it and who can operate on it such that I, if I'm, if I understand the program, not like what Wikipedia, open source. Yes, exa exactly. So let me use Wikipedia for example. Everyone can go to Wikipedia to edit it, and it gets approved. And then I can edit Wikipedia today. Somebody else will see what I've edited. That is open source. The same thing happens to some codes or some uh, programs that are made open source, and that's also like the foundation or the basis of the open source LMSs. Now, the open source LMSs are LMSs that have been created by some institutions or some organizations that are now made open, which means that anybody that understands the code can go into that LMS code and recreate their own type of LMS from it or modify that LMS to suit their needs or even start creating plugins or additional um, features that can like add-ons to the LMS. Now, and then we now have the proprietary LMSs or the closed source LMS. And I'm going to give the, the, the difference between both of them very soon. Now, the closed source LMSs are the ones that are owned by organizations that the codes are secured. Nobody can edit the code, it's just them and they sell it. Now, the difference between one of the difference between the proprietary and the open source LMSs for an open source LMS. I can go to one of them sites now and download the installation package for free. If I have a bit of technology knowledge, I can set it up for free and use it for free without paying a dime. Now, the only thing I'll be paying for, which is not even to the organization, but is going to be a cost borne by, the, by my own um, institution is that I need to have that technical skills to set up an LMS. I need to have that technical skills to host the infrastructure in which the LMS will be. If you have a technology team, that's at least one of the problems of, so your technology team can provide that infrastructure, and then, but you need somebody who can host it. Now, in terms of the administration of the LMS, you won't be able to get one-on-one -on -one support from the institution or the organization that created that LMS. However, because it is an open source LMS, you will be able to find communities of users or programmers who have probably tried one or two things and you will be able to learn. They also have documentations, which if you understand a bit of some of the languages, you would be able to 
use the documentation to guide you in administering it. An example of some of those open source LMS are the ODO, O D double O, the A Tutor, the Masterio, the Canvas, the Moodle, and the former LMS. Now, if you go to any of these websites, the first uh, six I've mentioned, you can download their installation packages. If you understand web technology, you're able to set it up and then you're able to customize it. The other advantage of the open source LMS is, is that because it is open source, like I've shared, you can see free plugins to use. Now, the challenge with open source systems is that because they are open, and this is me going a bit into web security, is that because they are open, they are somewhat porous in the sense that if I know the code that makes up an element, I can create a virus to go into that system. And that's why these LMSs come with um, updates periodically. However, if for, if for any reason there is a security breach, you cannot owe them to you because you are, whether it's an open source element. So apart from the installation or technical knowledge, you also need to understand a bit of web security, cloud engineering, and the likes to be able to set it up. Now going to, to the proprietary elements, like I said, those ones are closed. So these are the ones that you go to organizations to buy from. And the difference between one of the different, another difference between the proprietary and open source elements is why the open source, you can deploy it on your own infrastructure in your um, company's environment, environment, I mean your cloud environment. For proprietary elements, they cannot do that. And reason being that the moment they deploy their system on your infrastructure, it means that you have access to their code, which is what makes it proprietary in the first place. So they don't do that. What they can offer you is to mirror their, your instance, which is your own, maybe when they create your account, we'll call it instance. They mirror your own environment in, on your website so that people would not necessarily go to their own platform to access your interface, but through your own website, they can see your, um, your interface. And sometimes what some of them do is, and again, going a bit into technical, um, technical detail is, they are able to collect your URL. So I'll say maybe HR Tech, for example, wants to have a proprietary LMS with one of these guys, say let's say Docebo, for example. What Docebo would do is create a, a, an instance for HR Tech and call it maybe hrtech.docebo.com. And then they will tell you that, you know what, give us a custom URL such that when people visit that URL, it will redirect them to that. So people will not see or know those hrtech.docebo.com. What they will know is learning.hrtech.com. So those are some of the things they do. Now, the challenge with, not really a challenge for companies that don't find that as an issue, with proprietary LMS is that you pay for them. While some open source LMS, if you don't have the technical knowledge, you also pay the technical guys to pay. But for proprietary LMS, you would have to pay. And the payment for proprietary LMSs vary depending on whatever agreement you have with them. Some of them will first of all charge for the deployment fees, and then they will charge you per user you have on the LMS, and then they will charge you per courses on the LMS. So depending on the amount of staff you have and the amount of courses you are looking to deploy on the LMS will determine how much you'll be paying yearly. And they try to make it flexible or elastic in sense that when staff go or you have new staff, the total pay increases or decreases. Now, there are some proprietary LMSs that do not even allow people upload courses on it. And that's why understanding these functions of the LMS is really important. Some people will come and sell LMSs to you that come with courses. It's good. But then when you go to your drawing board to ask yourself, why are we getting an LMS? Are you looking to be able to upload your courses on the LMS? If yes, then don't go to the LMSs that will not allow you to upload courses on it. Because then what, it means that once you get that one, you will need to get another one to be able to upload your course. So your strategy and your goal is also very important in selecting your LMS and also understanding the different course format it takes. So some of the LMSs that fall into these proprietary categories are the Docebo, 
the total talent elements, net dimensions, e front, eye spring, we have the skill ports, we have the percipio, and a lot of them like that. And the funny thing about it is Totara, for example, was built on the module open source elements. You know, I mentioned earlier that the open source, the codes are there. If you understand the code, you can modify it and use it for yourself. So what the Totara team have done is that they went to Moodle, picked the Moodle-based code, and then recreated something good with custom features and then put it out there for sale. So they now closed it to Totara and then started building on that. Your LMS can also have other features. So like I mentioned, the basic features. Some LMSs have features such as competency mapping. Um, some of them have certification issuance, automatic certification issuance. Some of them even have uh, inter interoperability, which means that you can integrate them with other systems existing in the organization. Again, all these features, you need to have thought about it. And that's why when you go into the implementation of an LMS, the first thing you do before you even engage any LMS vendor is to plan. And in this planning phase, this is where you engage all the stakeholders required. You need to know why you are getting the LMS. Is it worth it to get an LMS? And these are some questions I ask people when they come and say, oh yeah, we want to have an LMS. Whilst you have your open source LMSs that are free, the resources that you will need to manage those elements will cost the company something. So do you think it's worth it? Now, when people now hear the price, ah, a lot of people will be like, I don't think I need LMS now. Because why would you spend, if you look at the charge out rate of your staff, if it's an open source or you, the cost you are paying to get a closed source element. If you look at the cost, why would you get that elements when you are only looking at the moment you only have two courses you want to put on the elements some closed source elements go as high as hundred thousand dollars depending on the amount of users and some of them can be less so you can imagine an organization maybe an fmcg um, that has about more than six thousand staff scattered across the country looking to get an LMS, and their immediate courses were just to have two courses and they did not plan to increase the courses in the course of the year. What it means is that for that one year, they are paying $100,000 just to host two courses. And I can assure you, regardless of how far those um, people are, there are cheaper ways to deploy that, that, those two courses other than getting an element. So the question you need to ask yourself, do you really need the elements? Why do you need the elements? Then you start going into what are the things you would want this LMS to do? We've listed out some of the key features. Now, do you want your LMS to be able to connect to your existing HRMS? Oh, yes. What are the kind of connections you will need? And that's where roles like business analysts um, come in or solution design. But as, as an HR professional and L&D professional, you need to have some business acumen skills and you need to be able to speak through the cycle of your of your of your space. Do we want the LMS to connect to these HRMS? Oh yeah. So how do you want it to connect? What information should they exchange? Oh, so we have that um, at the end of the year, people are meant to complete ten courses. I want it such that as they are completing the courses, it is showing on their dashboard on the HRMS that they are connecting it. That information you have it documented such that when you are engaging an LMS vendor or you are looking to get the open source LMS, you're already looking at those features, apart from the basic features that we've listed, you are looking at it if it meets your requirements. Are those requirements a do or die requirement? If they are, that means if they don't meet it, you are not going with those elements. But what happens most times is that because people are trying to jump on the thread of, oh yeah, we, too, we are going tech in our organization, this, we want to have an LMS. They miss a lot of things. They don't consider a lot of factors. And then at the end of the day, they get an LMS and then they have to junk it after maybe a year because one, they notice that people are not really using it. Two, uh, it does not really meet their, their requirements and the like. So it's always good to start with the planning. Then you go to the design, which is where you are talking about the functionalities. And then you play scenarios 
of how the LMS is going to be used. Do you would you need people to register on the LMS? Are, the courses you want to put on the LMS, are they going to pay for the courses? Do you have maybe Office 365 and then you don't want people to create another user data so that they will have um, one sign off? So if we have our Office 365 or our email address, you want them to be able to log in with that email address. So all those things are things you also need to consider. And that's why when you, are start, when you start going into the tech space or trying to do solution designs for L&D or HR, you need to think like a technology person because people will come to sell a lot of things to you. And if you don't know your onions, they will sell things that you will think, oh, yes, you've gotten value. Then when you start using it, you now start regretting that, oh, no, we've wasted a lot of money and we are not getting value. So the bulk of the work is in the planning and design phase. Then once you've now planned it, you're also looking at the resources you have available. Do we have somebody who is able to manage it? Do we have people who can manage the technology? Before you now go, okay, so are we building the elements or we are buying the elements? Now I've showed those the two different types of LMSs. Even the um, open source elements, you can get consultants to come and deploy on your infrastructure and give them a one-off payment, provided you have internal resources who can manage it. So that case, you are looking at building. Now, I don't advise that you consider building an LMS from scratch. Don't even try it. I've tried it and it didn't work. So don't even try it. Except you are so sure that maybe it's a very long-term goal. Now you are looking to create something that is going to be proprietary. And you are not just looking to recoup the benefits immediately. You are looking at a very long-term goal, say 10 years, 15 years ago. Then you can start that journey. But if it is just to meet your learning needs and the likes, I would not recommend it because there are a lot of um, options that you can pick from whether on the open source market or the closed source market. So you decide on whether you want to build and buy. Now, when you've deployed your LMS, whether you built it or you bought it, then the next thing is to test. Because before you start allowing people to use it, you need to be sure that it is ticking the box of the things you want. Can people take courses? What type of course content can this LMS um, allow? Videos, audios, ETC. Test it, test it on the different platforms based on what you plan. Do you want people to be able to take it on their mobile phones? You test it. Do you want people to be able to take it on their laptops or tabs? You test it. In the different locations, you get some people in the different regions to access it to test. Now, once you've done the testing and you are okay, then you need to train your internal admin that will be able to do first aid. So by first aid, I mean your first line or first level support, depending on the case whether you build or buy. Because your internal staff will first of all reach out to maybe the HR or the L&D team before they even go to the technology team, before you now go to the vendor, if, it is a, if, you, if you bought the platform. So you need to train them on how the platform is, with the features, how they can do things from an admin and also from the user point of view. Then you start awareness. Now, one of the challenges people, um, organizations face with LMSs, for example, is that they do little or no awareness. And I tell people that marketing in L&D is as important as developing the courses itself. And I use this analogy. If, if you've spoken with me before, you probably have heard me talk about, you use this analogy before. You can cook a good food, but if you don't market it to people to come and see that good food you've made, people might not even know that you made something great. And that's where the awareness comes in. You need to be able to sell this platform like it is no man's business. It's not a case of you built it and then you like, if they like, they should go and take the course. The courses are for them. No, because at the end of the day, the success of that platform is dependent on the usage of the platform. At the end of the year, they will come and ask you, this thing you spent X, Y, Z money on, are people using it? Then you'll be like, uh, we deployed courses. Yes, we deployed courses, but are people using it? Why are they not using it? And the awareness is, will be around letting people know that this platform is there, letting people see how it is used, even guiding them on how to use it. And I'll say from, from experience, I've done projects with 
one of the apex banks in 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 at least in Nigeria. And when we wanted to launch the LMS, then I think as far back as twenty seventeen, it was a carnival. We went to different states to do sensitization on the LMS, ask questions because we had to first of all identify learning champions across the country. We went there, talked to them about it, show them how the platform is used. We went to Abuja, did a lot of demonstration. We've already done the element, did a lot of demonstration, banners here and there, something new is coming, this and that. And then the time the LMS was to be in short, we launched the LMS in Lagos and Abuja. We had a huge celebration in Lagos as part of our awareness, old school themed party. People should come, we'll talk about digital transformation, LMS, this and that. We went to Abuja, we did the same thing. And that's the extent in which organizations are creating awareness. Why? For people to use the solution they've created. There was one institution, one academic institution, we also deployed LMS for. And what they did was they had a one-week activation, um, activation awareness period based on recommendations I gave them. See, get learning champions. And what they did, they got learning champions within the institutions, gave them shares, created um, a question area where people can go and ask questions. There was banner, there was sound, music, and stuff. And I'm not saying that for your organization, you need to do big party. But awareness, like sending periodic emails, guys, something is coming. Um, how about if you learn at your own pace? Imagine sleeping on your bed and be able to complete courses. How easy would life be? Those kind of sensitization would whet people's appetite to want to use your elements. And when you are launching your elements, if you've done serious work in awareness, you don't launch an LMS with just two courses. Because you can imagine creating one week awareness and people are expecting courses only for them to get to the elements and see two courses. No. That's why you need to plan your LMS strategy and deployment. Well, say, if we are going to do this, before we make the noise, maybe we should create a strategy around creating more courses on the LMS. And some of the ways organizations do is to quickly convert their policies on, convert their policies. Okay, I already see questions here. Convert their policies into digital learning and then put it on the LMS. So that at least when people go there, they first see policies. And then they now create like a roadmap into how um, they would deploy the LMS. So here yeah, I just pretty much talked about how you um, drive adoption in terms of the awareness bit. We are creating the communication plan. How do you plan to do this awareness? Who are the key people you need to talk to? Do you need the CEO to come and make a speech? Do you, how do you plan to go about it? Are you going to go departments? Do you want to do it via email? Do you want to do fiscal activations? Do you want to do banners in different places in the organization? How do you go about uh, implementing that? Then you look at ways to offer incentives. Now, these incentives can be physical or virtual. Incentives can be, okay, you finish a course, you get a voucher. Or you finish a course, you get points which are added to your appraisal, which are added to your um, end of year goal. And then that way, it also boosts their map. Or it gives a multiplier effect on some key lines in their goal. So for example, if you are meant to complete 10 courses to get five points on your appraisal, if you do two courses on the LMS, it automatically multiplies your cost by 1.5 or your whatever you score in that goal by 1.5. It means that I don't need to finish all the courses that have been assigned to me to get my full point. I just need to go on the platform to finish two courses and then that gives my score my third. So you need to think about how you look to incentivize people. And the whole idea of that incentive is to drive the adoption. And then you provide ongoing training and support. So you don't just deploy and then leave it. You open that channel for people to reach out to you, create FAQs, put emails that people can reach out to, um, put contact that they can escalate issues to, make those things available create a user guide on how to use the platforms and the likes. Then you foster a culture of continuous learning. I'm hearing a nice but I think I'll just continue. So how do you foster a culture of continuous learning? You know, they say that what you reward and what you penalize determine what your culture is like. 
So you also need to look at how you can include um, learning um, completion into your performance management system. Look at how you can include that into your conversation, how you can include that into your values. Let people know that learning play a major role in the organization. And these are ways you drive adoption. And if you're able to implement these strategies effectively, you will definitely see a huge usage and a huge demand for your digital or learning management system solution. So going into the trends and future developments, and I know that everyone here has heard about ChatGPT and what ChatGPT is doing to businesses and how it can be used. And a lot of these trends are also affecting the LMS, um, LMS excuse me, environment. And one of them is mobile learning. Now, because people are looking to learn on the go, there has now been a demand for your LMS to be compatible with mobile devices, or even at, at most, maybe I even have a mobile app version so that people can learn on the go. It's not every time you want to bring out your laptop and learn. Maybe you are um, on transit or something. So now one of the features people look out for is this LMS you are giving to me. Can I access courses on my phone? Is there a mobile app to look out for, um, that we can use to also access the courses? And then bit size learning. I think Nelson mentioned uh, bit size learning earlier, where people don't want to take your entire course before they know how to do something. And I'll give an example. Um, my generator a while back, well, my generator does not have remote or key. So I use, I pull it whenever I want to put it on. And then the rope caught one day. It was very late at night. And one thing I did was I just went online to, because I know that there are some knotting mechanisms. So I went online to look at how the Navy SEALs and the likes do some very tight knotting. And they gave me six pictures. With those pictures, I was able to tie the rope in such a way that it was not going to break again. And I started my gym. People need support like that. They don't want to read, um, take a course on rope, and then they will get the history of ropes, how the Egyptians started using rope. Nobody wants to do that. They need things to that they can implement immediately on the job. And that's where bad size learning comes. Does your LMS have that feature that enables us to upload lightweight, bite size learning? Then we go into gamification. I know most of us have had, well, a good number of us will have had about gamification, even though the number of people get it wrong. But the whole essence of gamification is bringing non-gaming, uh, sorry, bringing in game context and designs into non-gaming environment. And that's why you see some platforms today having points. You see them having leaderboards. You see them having um, levels. These are gamification elements. And this, elements are basically to drive engagement. Because there's a belief that when things are fun and there's a bit of competition and there's a bit of adventure, people will tend to use it. So you see people asking for LMSs that come with gamification feature. Does it have points? Does it have badge? So you see some LMSs today now, they come with badge. So if you finish maybe like five courses, you get a badge that shows that you're a professor or things like that. And within the organization, there is this competition around, oh, yes, I've gotten this badge. I have this amount of points on the platform and the likes. So people are beginning to ask for things like that. Then you go into data analytics. Now, it is, enough, it is not okay now to just have an LMS that will give you Excel reports. Can, you, can it give us visual repre representation of this? Does it have some other filters within the report that we are able to have some pictures of how the LMS is used. Can we get insights from these LMS? And so that we are having um, LMSs come up with different, even more granular um, data analysis features that allow people or organizations make decisions with when it comes to usage, when it comes to adoption, when it comes to favorites. Then we go into AI integrations. I think AI integration is really the one taking the LMS space by storm. And it is primarily because right now, in short, at the, there are conversations around the fact that LMS now are even getting outdated. 
and there are new sets of platforms called the LXPs. They are called the learning experience platforms. And those platforms help create personalized learning with the use of AI. So they call them intuitive um, learning design, which means that depending on the on my profile, on some tags I like, just like your Facebook or your Instagram. Now you've noticed something. If you like a post on Instagram, maybe an advert, or you comment on a post, or maybe for some reason you were chatting with somebody and you mentioned something, you start seeing those adverts coming at your face. And that is how AI, AI uh, machine learning works because they are able to, based on some activities or some decisions you make. So by this one, I'm saying, did you like this post? How long did you spend on this post? Did you comment on this post? They are able to start showing you similar courses or similar content that they believe meets your, your what you like. And that's how these LXPs work. They're able to create personalized learning such that if on onboarding on the platform, you're able to say, okay, these are my interests. This is my role. When you go on that platform, you don't even need to search for courses. What's the courses you'll be seeing on your pages are courses that meet those parameters that you've selected. And that is what is happening now with AI integrations on platform. And we have a number of LXPs, that's the learning experience platforms. We have the likes of Percipio. Initially, it's QSoft, uh, one of the learning providers, have a platform called Skillport. Now with the um, introduction of AI, they created another platform called Percipio, which gives you a more personalized learning. Then we have the likes of Go One. Go One is also another learning experience platform. And a lot of things are coming into play now. We have things like the augmented reality, the virtual reality, and the like, which are also giving us that immersive learning. And now we'll be seeing LMSs that also tolerate or can deploy or deliver those kind of courses. So a lot is happening in the digital learning space. And one of the reasons why we are having this kind of sessions, even at here and at OLXD, is to make sure that we are up to date with things that are happening. And rather than start from where, maybe because we are just getting to know about it now, they want to start from where the people were in 1996. Since we know what the updated trends are, why don't we start from where everybody is and then we'll catch up quickly. So that's the brief about the future um, and trends um, of the element. And I think we've, at least throughout this session, we've covered the brief on LMS, the features, the functionalities, the how to implement LMS, the driving adoption and trends and the future development in the LMS space. So I think that will be all today. And I'm open to questions. I see some questions already, and I'm even afraid because those questions look like there are multiple lines of questions. My mind is doing big, big, big that you, you read this question, but yes, questions, and um, I'll be happy to answer them. So Richard, should I go with the questions in the chat by Beatrice before any other questions? I'm well informed. Uh, those questions, I think they have disappeared from my end, but there are questions okay. Helen asked about, about um, common challenge. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. Common challenges sorry. in managing and <coughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Common sorry, challenges sorry. that face learning and management systems. And how do you create um, the return on investment when you want to convince the management that there is benefit in having an LMS? How do you go about Good. how do you sell uh, an LMS? to the management and also what are the commonest challenges? I think you can take those two. Okay, so I think um, on the ROI, I think Beatrice also asked that question. So I'll start with the common challenges in managing a learning management <clears throat> system. And I think the first is lack or little information about the LMS. So what sure, that sure. has caused is that it makes people jump into learning management system or acquire learning management system without knowing what they are getting themselves into. 
So if you before you even go into getting a land management system at all, I will advise that you do your thorough research to have that information. Else, one thing about vendors is that they are out to sell. Whether you are going to use it or not, even though they hope and pray that you use it, but the first thing is that they just want to sell first and they are going to sell you anything. And the way consultants work, because again, I've also been, been a consultant and I still um, work in that capacity is, they listen to you to hear your pain. Now, the LMS can do a lot of things, but because they've listened to you, they're able to sell that to you. And there's your LMS will solve this. You have people with headache in your office. Oh, 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 come and get our LMS. Once you deploy the LMS, headache is gone. And that's how they sell it. But if you don't know about this, and so I'll advise first, and this, are, this is the bedrock of all the challenges we have, is the lack or little knowledge of LMS. Now, the second is, expertise. Whilst we are jumping into elements, we have little people who can actually manage and administer the elements. So even though you get the elements that is going to be very useful to your organization, do you have the expertise to manage the elements? And that's why in some cases, it's probably always best to go for the uh, proprietary elements where they provide some level of handholding throughout at least for a period of time before they now leave it to you and then you use them as your second level support. Lack of expertise have made people, I have seen an organization that unknown to them, they purchase two elements, two proprietary elements that they use in their organizations for different things, whereas they could have just used one. And that's waste of money. And even the elements they are using, they are not maximizing it because the people that are just using the only thing they know how to use, and because they are afraid to even try to see what other features there are, they are unable to really maximize it and they are spending a lot of money on it. So, and there are other challenges, lack of expertise. Before we now start going into lack of funding within the organization, uh, improper infrastructure, and then adoption, because so you can have the knowledge, you can have the expertise to manage it. You can know all the features to, to use, but now getting your people to use the platform is always the challenge. And so you need to adopt a lot of mechanisms or strategies in getting your people to use it. And that's why I always recommend that elaborate marketing. Again, I don't expect that everybody will do parties, this and that. But just as when you are introducing a product to your customers outside, if you are deploying an element, you should do some kind of engagement to those people so that they appreciate it and create a strategy around how you are going to maintain the courses, to maintain the momentum. Like I said, you cannot do a one month marketing and for people, for you to launch the elements and we are always saying two courses. After six months, there's no other course. A year, no additional course. That momentum will just plummet and then people would not come to that platform again, then you will now need to start. That's when you say we have relaunched the LMS and then put more courses. So the awareness is also a challenge, um, um, one of the challenges people people face when deploying LMS. Um, I hope I've answered that. And for ROI, now for L&D or HR professionals, which um, make up the large number of people on this call, you are a business partner. And as a business partner, it means that you need to have a little bit of business acumen to know what the selling points to your management are. What is it that your management wants to hear? Because I can tell you that, oh, come from the point of view that, yes, it's going to help us develop our staff. Okay. But is that what your management wants to hear? Sometimes what you can use to sell LMS could be the fact that, you know that if we adopt LMS, we are also going to contribute to the reduction of carbon emission in the world. So if you are working with an organization that, have, that is very particular about carbon footprint, you're saying, oh yeah, if we deploy an LMS, it means that people will not need to travel to take courses, which means that they will not emit carbon monoxide on their transportation. It means that we would not use paper, which means that we are reducing deforestation. 
Now, I've not talked about learning and development. I've not talked about building capabilities. I'm speaking to what the organization or the executives want to hear. And when some, some executives hear this, they're like, oh, yes, these initiatives can feed into our sustainability report. Let us buy the LMS. That is one selling point. Another bit is costs, cost management. You know that with LMS, the, and you are talking with data. If we are going to plan a training for 1,000 people, it means that we are going to fly in about 50% of those people to this particular location, house them for this particular period. And also transportation, we are going to need to get um, apart, um, venues and the likes. If we use LMS, do you know that all those operational costs have been reduced and we are just going to pay one-time fee to deploy, develop the courses and we can reuse the courses. Then you are selling it. So how you sell your element, and this is me think, bringing selling point from three different aspects of a business um, concern. So you can sell your elements to your organizations when you understand what the pain point is. Then the regular thing, because again, apart from those things, whatever it is your courses on the LMS would achieve, your physical training can achieve it. So now we are not looking at what training would do, but we are looking at what the LMS would do to the organization. And you can look at it from sustainability. You can look at it from being able to reach people. You can look at it from being able to deploy organization-wide training. You can look at it from convenience to your learners. You can look at it from um, maybe this is one of the things that the organizations or the staff have requested. And if you understand the strategy and the organization has this long-term goal of digital, digitalizing every process of the organization, you can say um, hiring or getting an LMS feeds into the digital long-term digital strategy of the organization, which also puts us in a good state when it comes to our global or long-term goal. That can be another selling point for your element. So these are different ways to sell the elements. And again, if you cannot restrict yourself to those. You just need to understand your business, understand the solution you are looking to deploy, and then know how to marry that solution with the business so that when you are presenting it, you are speaking the language of the business to sell and to sell the solution. And this is how you sell every other thing you are selling as a business partner to your organization. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate your very candid, very elaborate presentation on learning management systems. We have learned a lot and we appreciate. We are very grateful. Uh, we pray that uh, when we are going to do now the, the demo, you will be around as well to guide us on how to do the demo. Uh, because of time issues, uh, we will say very much, very much for those people who have been in Johnson, bless you very much. May you prosper. I think um, your presentation has made us people who, who will know our onions, especially that part you touch that HR people must be very good in a business partnership. Lastly, uh, Nelson, do you have something to wrap the conversation? Uh, nothing much from my end. Yeah. I want to appreciate uh, Demola for that good work that he has done. And also thank our members for staying with us for this long. And I believe it has been one, one long hour for serious discussion because LND is not always a, a, a small issue. And now that we're bringing technology, it becomes a bigger issue. And uh, if, you, if you may allow, we are having Martin. Martin Wanjo, he has been with us here. Need you, I think he needs to give us the closing remarks so that you can close the session. Martin, before we get back to you. Wanjo, are you in? Okay. I saw him leave. Mm. Okay. And then that's okay. So for me, I'm grateful for each and every person who has attended this session. And next week, we are also going to share our uh, our next steps on this. So we are saying that we are looking at a, a system that will be able to do a demo on a full a full LMS that you can come in and see how it works. 
Thank you very much. And uh, my, my friend Beatrice Sigay, it's her first time here. And I hope a lot of us, most of us also has got their first time here. But we say this is how we learn every day. We're combining tech with HR. We want to become as powerful as we can. Thank you all and have a good night. Thank you very much, Jay Nelson. Thank you very much, Johnson. Good night. Uh, now you can unmute and write goodbye, good night. Thank you.